We are up to chapter six, Mishnah number five. Al tevakesh gedulal asmcha. Do not seek greatness for yourself. Val tachmo kavod and do not covet honor. Yoser milimudcha ase more than your learning. Let your performance be. Val tesavel leshulchanim shemalachem and do not lust for the table of kings. Shashulchancha gadol meshulchanim because your table is greater than their table. Vitisrecha gadol mikisram and your crown is greater than their crown. Venemu bamalachtecha sheshalem lachaschaper lasecha and trustworthy is your employer, namely God. He will pay the wage of your labor. So this is continuing the theme of this chapter. It's all about Torah. And of course, we began with the importance and the power of Torah. Lishma, if you learn Torah for its, its sake, it gives you all these great uh, powers and, and, and transformations. And we talked about the danger of neglecting Torah. And we talked about the importance of according honor to Torah teachers. And in the most recent Mishnah, we had the idea of Torah and asceticism, just bread and salt and sleep on the ground. And now we have Mishnah number five, and that is to not pursue greatness and honor, to not covet the tables of kings. Your table is greater, your crown is larger, and trust God that he will deliver on his promises. Now the next Mishnah, 6.6, six, is maybe the most famous Mishnah in the entire book. It's certainly the most unique one, where it talks about the 48 ways to wisdom. We'll get to that, please God, next time. But this is Mishnah number five, and that is what should you pursue? Don't pursue honor, don't covet honor, don't pursue greatness and prestige. Trust God, he will deliver to you what you need. So let's go through some of the commentators here and see what they say. One of the ways that this Mishnah is interpreted is based upon a, a bargain that the Torah scholars have with God. There's an agreement. There is a deal here in place. If you dedicate yourself to God's cause, he will take care of you. He will make your needs something that he addresses. We had a mission earlier. If you make his will your will, if you adopt his agenda, he will take care of you. So that's the, the basic background for, for this Mishnah. If you make the Almighty's agenda your agenda, if you undertake to fulfill what he wants in this world, he'll make sure that all your needs are met. And this Mishnah is telling us the attitude that you should have. It should be passive. Don't pursue greatness for yourself. Every person has to choose what area of life they want to pursue. And this Mishnah is telling us you choose to pursue righteousness and let everything else come your way. There are certain things that we, we need in life, but we don't aggressively pursue it. We say, you know what, when it comes my way, then I'll have it. And then there are other things in life that we aggressively pursue. That is our focus. And here we have guidance for the Torah scholar. Don't pursue the greatness and the honor and the prestige and to be like a king and to have everything. No, you pursue the agenda of God and you could trust him that he will deliver upon his word. And the poster child of this is, of course, King David. And he, and he, tells, that, and he tells us in Psalms 23 that goodness and divine kindness will chase me every day. I'm not pursuing them. They're pursuing me. What will I do? And I will dwell in the house of God for the length of my days. I'm going to sit in the house of God. I'm not going to pursue this goodness and this divine kindness, but it will chase after me. Why? Because that's the promise of God. He will not abandon those who dedicate themselves to him. And here we're warned in this Mishnah not to pursue the honor and the glory and the prestige and the greatness. Let it come our way. Another example of this is Jacob. When Jacob had nothing, he was fleeced by his nephew as he was fleeing from, from Esau. All he asked for, all he prayed for, was clothing to wear and bread to eat. The absolute bare necessities. That's what he pursued. That's all he wanted. In the end, of course, God sent him great riches. 
but he only pursued the minimum. And that's the idea. What is the focus? What are you chasing? What are you pursuing? He's pursuing the spiritual world. If you do that, you can trust God. He will deliver on his side of the bargain. He will deliver on his promise. And in the end, of course, Jacob ended up with both. There was one instance in Jacob's life where he chose this world. And for that, he was punished. And if you read Jacob's story without looking at Rashi or any of the commentators of our sages, you can't find the one instance in Jacob's life where he prioritizes the physical world over the spiritual world. And the reason is because it's only one word. It's only one word. Our sages scanned Jacob's life, scoured it from beginning to end, and found only one word which seems to, that seems to imply that he pursued a life of comfort in this world. And almost all the tumult in the second half of Jacob's life was a result of that. This is Parshas by Yeshev. This is Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. The verse says, Vayeshev Yaakov, Yaakov, Jacob settled in the land that his parents lived in, in the land of Canaan. He settled down, says Rashi, quoting from our sages. Jacob wanted peace. He wanted stability. He wanted to live without all the nonsense and all the mishagas that he had had previously. Asaph tries to murder him. He has thrown away. He spends 20 years with Laban, and he tries to rob him at every turn and eventually has to leave and, and Laban pursues him. And after he avoids that confrontation, he finds out that Asa was coming with 400 men trying to kill him and he avoids that. And finally he's home. It's been a chaotic couple of decades. He wants to just relax a little bit. By Asia of Yaakov, he's settled. And right away, the anger and the wrath of the episode of Joseph Descended upon him, jumped upon him. Says Rashi, and this is chapter 37. The righteous, they want to sit, they want to be at ease and comfort. Is that what you're pursuing? Is it not enough for you what's prepared for you in Olam Abba? You want to have peace and serenity and tranquility and comfort in this world? Let's see what happens. And he might throw some of the biggest curveball of them all, the episode of Joseph, Joseph and his brothers, and eventually Joseph is presumed dead. And that whole crazy story that happens to Jacob, all as a result of him choosing comfort. Again, this is Jacob judged, of course, relative to his greatness, as everyone has always done in the Torah. Yeah, everyone's always judged at their level. But this is the same idea here in our Mishnah. We have to choose what we want to pursue. And you cannot pursue both worlds. To the degree that you're pursuing this world, you are neglecting the spiritual world. And we, we have this general idea that when you pursue the spiritual world, God will ensure that your needs in this world are met and covered. Now, there is an interesting law here that states that although the Torah scholar should not, should not pursue riches in this world. Nevertheless, it is a mitzvah for us to help the Torah scholar in the event that there's a business opportunity that they could do on the side. Like a side hustle. You've heard of a side hustle? It's okay for the Torah sage to have a side hustle. It's not the main focus. It's a side hustle. That's encouraged. And we are encouraged to the best of our ability if we have an opportunity and we know that the that the tzaddik, the righteous person, the Torah scholar has some capital to invest. We say, you know what? Here, you can invest this opportunity. Bring it to him. Enable him to have a side hustle that is our mitzvah. Because by doing that, we're really partnering with God. God wants to bestow goodness upon the Torah scholar. We could be a vehicle to that, to doing that. That is a great opportunity. And if we could do that without him leaving the academy without even needing to pursue it, just get them on board. If you have an opportunity, you need some investors, it's a great opportunity, reach out to the Torah sages, see if they want to invest. And in general, wouldn't it be great to have that as part of the investor group? You have the righteous, the tzad, the Torah scholar as part of the investment group. Isn't that a nice little bonus to 
to have on the side. So that's an idea that the Talmud tells us that even though the, the Torah sage is, is encouraged to not pursue it, it could be a side hustle and other people should try to facilitate side hustles for the Torah sage. That's the first idea of the Mishnah, to not pursue the greatness, let it come to you and your pursuits should always be the spiritual. Now, the Chassid Yaivetz, he reads an interesting nuance in this Mishnah. Do not seek greatness for yourself. The words for yourself seem to be superfluous. Why does it say for yourself? So the Chassid Yaivetz, he says that it is in fact appropriate to seek greatness, to seek greatness when it's not for yourself, when it's for the sake of the Torah. If it's not directed to you personally, if it's directed to the Torah, in that instance, it would be okay to seek greatness. And the way he explains it is that when people see the honor and the prestige and the glory of the righteous and of the sages, that may help spur them to pursue that. It makes it a more attractive life when they see the honor that is bestowed upon the righteous and they say, you know what? I'd love to have that honor as well. And they say, well, what are you do? Okay, well, I got to study, got to work on myself, refine my character. I'll do it if I get the honor. And of course we know that it's better to do it for altruistic reasons, but nevertheless, it's appropriate to do it for ulterior motives because that will eventually beget you develop a taste for it, you develop a taste for Torah, and you say, you know what, maybe you could graduate to more ulterior, to more altruistic reasons. And therefore, it is okay for a Torah scholar to pursue honor, but not for themselves, for the Torah, to, to elevate the stature of Torah and those who study it in the eyes of the lay people in order to make it a more attractive pursuit for them. Nice idea. And the next part of the Mishnah says, Yoser milimutcha say, more than you learn, you should do. Yoser milimutcha say. So Rashi interprets this uh, very in a very basic way. And that is, you have to practice more than you study. We don't want to have someone who is a great sage, but it's all abstract, it's all theoretical. How they behave, that doesn't matter. The idea of having a, a Chinese wall between someone's knowledge and someone's behavior, that is not a Jewish idea. That is not a Torah idea. The Torah's, the Torah's way is, and whatever you study, you think of a way to implement it. There's always a lesson attached to every idea. Every day has to have a lesson. What, what does it mean to me? How can I change my life based upon this idea in Torah? So, of course, studying is imperative, but actions are more important than the study. If you study it and it's just theoretical and you're not practicing it, then you are not fulfilling what, what's required of you. More than what you know, you should study it. You should, you should implement. You should do. It should, you, your, study should, your study should always be with the focus towards the practical, how you actually implement what you study. That's how Rashi interprets this part of the Mishnah. The Ruach Chaim, amongst others, they read the Mishnah or these words a little bit differently. The word limudcha means your study, but it also can mean your regimen. How much you're accustomed to, your quota. More than your quota, more than your regimen, you should do. Which means you should always push yourself just a little bit more than you're comfortable with. One slight bit past what you normally do, push the bar a little bit further every time. And every day, if you push yourself a little bit more, eventually you're going to conquer a lot of real estate and you'll improve in vast ways. Truth is, you know, we're very malleable. We're very changeable. Humans grossly underestimate their own capacities. We're capable of of unimaginable things. But the reason why most people, many people, a lot of people, some people don't actualize their potential 
is because you know they, they get into this little this little this this prison of their current self and their current regimen. And they think they're maxed out. This is all I'm comfortable with. Here we're told, push yourself one little drop past the point of, of ease, past the point of comfort, and you'll find out, you'll discover, wow, I can do that. And the next thing, push yourself one little tiny bit more. And one little tiny bit more, eventually, it just transforms everything. I read in, uh, in a great book called Atomic Habits. I'm sure y'all have heard of it. You just got to do 1% improvement every day. But of course, it all compounds. 1% every day, 1% better every day. If you're just 1% better than you were yesterday, and tomorrow, you're just, just, just 1% better than you are today. And the following year, just, just 1%, that's it. Over the course of, of a year, 1% compounded over the course, 1% per day compounded over a year is like 3,700%. Per, per annum every year. That's the power, of course, of, of compounding, but it, it shows how a small, slight incremental change over time compounds some very significant change over a significant time horizon. And that's the idea. If you just push yourself just a tiny bit, it doesn't have to be too much, and that, that, that's where things get tricky. If you push yourself way too much, if you bite off way more than you can chew, not only won't you improve, you'll actually probably snap back to a much lower level than your base. But if you take your base and push it up just a little bit more, it's more manageable and that can be done today. If you try to jump you know, 10 runs, you'll, you'll topple down to a very low point. And that's the skill, so to speak, of constructing a plan of self-transformation to know how much you can push yourself in a safe environment, in a safe way, that eventually it will accrue and it will compound and you will have a, a vast leap over a uh, um, period of time. So this is a beautiful idea from the, from the Ruach Chaim. And then the, fi the final idea here, uh, this is uh, also on a shared courtesy of the Ruach Chaim, don't covet the tables of the kings. Your crown is bigger than their crown. You're destiny your role is greater than theirs your table's bigger than theirs don't pursue a smaller table so what does this mean so i want to read you his piece here he says and this is you know over the course of our study of of Perkevus, of ethics of the fathers this commentary I've, I've kind of grown more fond of this commentary over time it's really uh it's really wonderful amazing amazing commentary uh, a Ruach Chaim by Rabbi Chaim Valajner, author, of course, of the Nefesh Chaim as well. The founder of the first modern yeshiva, the great yeshiva in Valajner. So he passed away in 1821. So he lived about 200 years ago. He says, the Yetzhara seduces man to try to focus on this world, the, the crown and the table of greatness in this world. And the argument that the Yetzirah says is, after all, the rich people, they're able to purchase all of Baba because they give charity and they give a great time in this world. They have everything. They have greatness in this world, greatness in all Baba, they have it all. And therefore, you should do the same thing. Don't waste your time in the, in the academy, in the study hall. Instead, pursue their path. As a response to this, our Mishnah says, don't covet the tables of the rich people in this world because your table is bigger than theirs. Why? Because the money will pay people as respect with respect to their difficulty. The more difficult it was, that is the result of their payment. And therefore, if you choose a more difficult path, you will end up with a greater reward. Your table will be larger than theirs. Your crown will be greater than theirs. And in Olam Abba, interestingly, he tells us, in Olam Abba, there's going to be competition. The table that you have that's referred to, being referred to in this Mishnah is referred to the table in Olam Abba. And the size of someone's table is relative to how hard they have to work to achieve that. And every person will be able to witness all the other people in the, in the spiritual world, and everyone will be singed from the canopy of their fellow meaning that there's going to be competition. 
you will be able to look at everyone else's table and see whose table is bigger. And then as a side note, he explains that the, the, um, the Talmud talks about the righteous in Olam Abba, and it says that their crowns are in their heads, not on their heads, in their heads. Why? Because what you earn in this world, the crown and the table and the canopy that you're earning in this world for all of us, for the afterlife, that is yours, and that cannot be removed. That's the lesson of this Mishnah, Mishnah number five of chapter six. What should we pursue? We have a choice. We have a choice. What we do with our time, what we do with our talents, what we do with our, with our money, with our resources, with our skills. We're given a finite amount of resources. And we have to allocate those resources. And that is the most important choice that we have in our lives. What are you going to invest in? And there are two worlds in general that we can invest in. One world, we know for sure that our tenure here is not going to be forever. We have another 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, whatever it is, it's fixed. The spiritual world, Omaba, is permanent, is eternal. We are, of course, deluded to thinking that this world is the world that's worthy of our investment. And of course, if you think about it logically, it doesn't make any sense. Because our tenure in this world is, is fixed. It's just, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 120 years. We don't know how long it's going to be, but we know for sure that it's not going to be eternal. And we have the, the specter, the prospect of an eternal world. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to favor the spiritual world. I'm sorry. To favor, it doesn't make sense to favor the temporary world and to neglect the spiritual world. And that is the real tension that's underlying the conflict of life. This is what it's all about. The Yetzirah is designed, the, the, the job description of Yetzirah is to get the foolish person to prioritize the temporary over the permanent. And the job of Torah and our soul on the other side is to get the person to focus on the permanent and not just to waste their time on the temporary. And we have a promise. The Almighty says, if you focus on my world and the permanent world, I'll make sure that your needs are covered in this world. I was a child and I got old and I never saw a righteous person wanting. Of course, we say that in the blessing that we say after, after, after we eat. The Almighty promises. You can trust him. He promises he won't leave us hanging. I'll make sure that even in this world, our needs will be met. And in fact, we can pursue the, the bare necessities that we can pursue. Even the righteous can pursue that. But the second we make a focus on this world as a priority on its own, and we neglect the spiritual world, we're making a very poor choice of favoring the temporary over the permanent. And again, I want to remind you that the next Mishnah is the most unusual one in the book, 48 Ways to Wisdom. There are 48 different ways to acquire Torah, and I'm really excited to, dig, and I'm really excited to dig into that in our next episode. I'm looking forward to doing that together. As always, we will just is... Rabbi Walby at gmail.com.